Hello. This video is made to be viewed not just by the typical Action Points audience, but by people within the game industry and by the general public who might only have heard of Kotaku but don't know much about them. For that purpose, please share this video widely. If you want people to know why they should not read, recommend, or even passively support Kotaku, the information in this video must become common knowledge. Before I make that case though, it has to be stated that the information presented does not represent all games journalists. And it's not even demonstrative of all people who worked at or are still part of Kotaku. Critical generalizations can be damaging and counterproductive to progress, no matter who they are made of. It is my belief, and the belief of others, that there is a serious problem with Kotaku that has gone unchecked for far too long. At the heart of this problem is a culture, created or at least nurtured by Kotaku under the long-standing stewardship of Steve Totillo, and a holdover from their former parent company, Gawker. Kotaku launched in 2004 as a part of Gawker Media, and Gawker Media was founded in 2003 by Nick Denton. If you are unfamiliar with Gawker Media, it might be because they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2016 when they lost a legal case against the wrestler Hulk Hogan for publishing a sex tape without his consent. If that sounds bad, this was normal for Gawker Media. What they did ranged from outing people's sexuality because they knew it would get plenty of clicks, to being unsympathetic to an alleged rape victim that asked for the tape of her abuse to be removed from the Gawker-owned website Deadspin. Oddly, the broad mainstream media seems to look fondly of them being spirited sensationalist outlet in farewell articles after it was closed down following the purchase of Gawker Media by Univision Communications. It seemed things might have turned a corner after Univision's purchase and Nick Denton faded into irrelevance. Unfortunately, this was not the case. To list all the awful and blatantly unprofessional things Kotaku has and continues to do would ultimately be a disservice to our time. There are too many to list, and if you are someone who is completely new to all this, thank you for your time so far. As a video game news website, people expect to get relevant news about video games, interviews with people in the industry, and reviews that reflect the quality of games available to purchase. Oftentimes, Kotaku fails to do even those things without making some embarrassing, easily avoidable mistake. Whether they are misreporting something or calling someone bigoted, failing to report conflicts of interest, acting hostile toward their reader for outrage-driven clicks, it seems Kotaku has plenty of mistakes to learn from. They've even fallen for hoaxes because they didn't bother to research before publishing. That's happened at least twice. Those hoaxes fit very well with their sensational evil gamer narrative that they like so much, and it appears they don't want to miss out on being the first to publish. Doing that would mean missing out on clicks and getting linked back as a reference. Regardless of all these journalistic failures, Steven Totillo, the editor-in-chief of Kotaku, is typically not far behind, ready to offer an apology and a quick update to save face when the mistake is terrible enough. To get a sense of how problematic Kotaku is in the industry, it's worth noting that they've been blacklisted before by Bethesda Softworks, Ubisoft and Sony. Totillo once wrote an article trying to argue his side, but this is only after Jason Scryer leaked information about Fallout 4 and got Kotaku blacklisted by Bethesda Softworks, the publisher of the Fallout series. Leaking information about a game in development can be damaging, as the game may change after that information is unofficially released, and audiences may get the wrong impression of what the game is. If the public sees an incomplete and rough looking game, it may turn audiences off entirely. This would be catastrophic for people working on the game and their families. It's not difficult to understand why a publisher or developer might think it's better just to avoid Kotaku entirely. Even if one was trying to give Kotaku the benefit of the doubt, they might find themselves ultimately assured by Steven Totillo's newest apology and a declaration that they will get it right next time. These apologies and promises don't seem all that sincere though. It should be within their ability, especially if they are cautious, to notice an article is titled, Animated Video Game Porn Should Be A Lot Sexier And Less Gross, and give it a check just to see if there's anything objectionable or offensive in it. In this case, Kotaku didn't, and published the article which depicted underage fictional characters in various sex acts. Later that day, the explicit images were removed and the article was updated. Two days later, Stephen published his own article titled, An Apology where he predictably apologized and once again assured the readers that Kotaku can do better and will. 
It might be worth noting that despite Stephen's platitudes, the article is still up, so that one can read the description of the underage fictional characters in explicit situations. This apparently qualifies for games journalism if you are apologetic enough. Does this really hurt anyone? Is something that can be heard in defense of Kotaku. If this is all new to you, you might also be wondering that. Sure, they've embarrassed themselves, but has it really caused harm? Yes. Yes, they have. This harms people. They've demonstrated they're irresponsible with the privilege of their platform, and not considerate of the repercussions. But they have demonstrated they're not just incompetent, but malicious. Even if someone tried to excuse Kotaku's routine misinformation because it was directed at an ideological enemy, it simply cannot be argued that it's not malicious for Kotaku to lie to and manipulate sexual abuse survivors in order to run sensational articles. The article I mentioned is two women accused Skyrim composer Jeremy Soule of sexual misconduct, and it was written by Cecilia de Anastasio. There's an archived version of the article in the description, but the point of contention for the sake of this topic is that one of the women, Natalie Lawhead, claims that de Anastasio lied to her about what was on and off the record and mischaracterized some of Lawhead's accounts. Denastasio eventually pressured Lawhead into giving explicit detail for Kotaku's lawyer, claiming that the article was ready to publish, but Lawhead not being more explicit about her abuse was holding everything up. When asked if the information would be shared, Denastasio assured Lawhead that it wouldn't be, and that sharing the details of a sexual assault would be exploitive and wrong. These details were included in the article anyway. Despite Denastasio telling Lawhead that she wouldn't, she decided that it was appropriate to include the explicit details of how the rape had happened, even though it wasn't required. Simply saying that it had happened was all the information the reader needed. Law had contacted Anastasio about having those details removed, so that she would not have to be further harassed by fetishist trolls, or be forced to relive something terrible with an online record forever tied to her name. But Anastasio took the position of telling Lawhead she was wrong, and that it was all on the record while evading responsibility. Denastasio also expertly claimed that a change could not be done unless it was a correction. Stephen Deltillo claims he was on vacation when the article was published. When that didn't work, a third party put Lawhead in contact with Stephen Deltillo, who displayed a similar professional demeanor that expertly put Lawhead on the defense, claiming that Lawhead was mistaken, cited Denastasio's recorded interviews as proof, recorded interviews which no one but Deltillo and Denastasio have access to, that is, and turned the interaction into a seven-day back-and-forth that eventually concluded with the explicit detail being removed from both Kotaku and Kotaku UK's article. It is crucial to recall that during all of this, Lawhead is the abuse survivor, already facing harassment because of Kotaku's poor reporting. This is clearly a horrible misunderstanding at best, but whether Kotaku or Lawhead was mistaken is not really even a matter of debate. It's clearly established that the claim that Kotaku does not edit things after publishing, or and to Teal's words, rarely cuts or edits, is a lie, proven by the fact that Kotaku seems to rarely update articles after making mistakes. If the precedent is to emulate print, like newspapers, that doesn't hold up, as newspaper corrections are offered as quickly as possible in a later edition. Kotaku does not have that limitation, so trying to offer that excuse is just negligent. The indisputable truth of the matter is, Kotaku's reporting was causing someone suffering, and rather than act on it, they were resistant. Denastasio could have reached out to Tatio to help Lawhead. She didn't. She had begun working for Wired, and later made an unsympathetic long tweet placing the blame on Lawhead. Tatio could have immediately had it altered to reduce Lawhead's trauma. He didn't. He dragged it out for several days after posing the situation as an inconvenience on him and the million dollar website he's chief editor of. What was months of anguish for Lawhead was probably no more than 20 minutes of editing in a web-based text editor for someone on staff. Kotaku put themselves first. It did not try to reduce harm where it could. All the journalists involved acted unethically and repeatedly made the choice not to immediately help Lawhead when approached. Lawhead shares that there were eight other women willing to act as sources, but Denastasio, for whatever reason, did not even report that these other women were bringing forward allegations. Lawhead later shared that Areli Brighton, the second woman mentioned in the Kotaku article, also claimed that Denastasio lied and misled her. Additionally, once Lawhead made her situation public, she states that other people contacted her 
claiming to have been similarly manipulated by Denastasio for past articles. They shared that they were also treated poorly and received with indifference when they told Denastasio the harm her reckless reporting had caused them. There is no defending Kotaku anymore. They are malicious. It's not enough to say Kotaku is the problem. The dilemma is far greater than one site and has been for a long time. After all, Denastasio no longer works for Kotaku. She writes for Wired now. The real cancer at the heart of this issue is a cultural problem. It's not the evil gamers, as Kotaku and others would have you believe. It's a culture within the games industry that is harming people. It is a culture cultivated by powerful people who will lie, cheat, gaslight, and harm others all in the pursuit of their own self-interest. In hindsight, it's easily recognizable, but unfortunately, it's not obvious when one is part of the industry or an outsider who relies on those responsible for the harm to give them information. As there's no proper name for this culture currently, for the sake of ease, it will be referred to as the Kotaku culture. To help you understand how this toxic culture works, let's use a real life example most people might be familiar with. Have you ever been in a social situation, at a job, or even during school where someone was mean to someone, whether it be yourself or a peer, but they seem to face no repercussions? Even stranger, the disruptive behavior was accepted, or at least tolerated by everyone else. Perhaps the aggressor had seniority, uh, was more popular, or higher in some sort of hierarchy. Regardless of what the reason was, you might have thought it was unfair that this person seemed to be exempt from the rules. Whether it be systemic or social, this is what can be described as a toxic culture. This is the nature of the Kotaku culture. This isn't speculation either, it's proven. Natalie de Graffenried wrote a first-hand account from her time at Kotaku titled Some Thoughts About a Website with a Fake Japanese Name, where she lays out how Kotaku is horribly mismanaged, treats people unfairly, and relies on that toxic culture just to get anything done. De Graffenried explains, The people running the industry, the people running the sites that report on the industry, often know each other. They're often friends. So even people leaving a terrible situation feel that they can't speak out when they're completely in the right to, let alone the people who aren't in a position to leave. You can enact a lot of horrifying behavior if you rely on the fact that the industry is small and work is hard to come by, and people often feel forced to stay quiet. De Graffin Reed even touches on Lawhead's situation. She says, A good chunk of the staff was horrified and didn't feel comfortable with the site supporting Cecilia the way it did if not because of their personal feelings about sexual assault, then because they had experienced the exact sort of abrasive, careless behavior Law had detailed with regard to Cecilia and her story. Just as one would expect from a toxic culture and unhealthy work environment, de Graffin Reed explains that objections of Denastasio were often framed as personal spats or someone just disliking her. In a toxic culture, an aggressor never faces repercussions, as those asking for accountability can be dismissed, or even vilified to discredit their fair objections. Looking back at Kotaku's roots with Gawker Media, it's easy to see how it played a hand in creating this toxic media culture that bullies and intimidates others. Remember, the aggressor example is seemingly above the rules, which seems to be the case with Kotaku and Gizmodo Media Group, which is what Gawker Media is called now. Large portions of the mainstream media still look back fondly at Gawker Media's vitriolic and sensational reporting, despite those being the same people who were unsympathetic to a rape victim after they published the video of her abuse. It makes perfect sense that Kotaku would also be unsympathetic to abuse survivors if it never held itself accountable and just attacked those who took issue with them. Though this is just my own belief, I anticipate it was because of the tabloid-style sites like Gawker who played it fast and loose that served as a model for the hyper-partisan, emotionally charged, opinion-driven programming that now consumes cable news and other social media. Gawker built a media empire that showed everyone just how profitable it could be to act like a troll. That is, their business model was to lie, insult people, and upset them with misleading titles. It worked for a while too, until they got sued by someone with more money. It has to be said again that not all game journalists support the toxic Kotaku culture. Just as DeGraff and Reed's Medium Post explained, whether it be someone in the game industry or a journalist, it can be difficult to maintain a career and push back at this unfair treatment, 
because it would threaten their job. A bully like this is counting on people to ignore or remain silent when abuse is heaped on others, because when everyone tacitly condones what's happening, it maintains the culture. Unfortunately, it is the silence that allows the abusive culture to go to other websites and thrive elsewhere in the game industry. With the industry being so well connected, a person does not even have to have worked at Kotaku to be part of this harmful and toxic group. They simply need to be good enough friends with those abusers that they allow it to happen and discourage those that want to speak out. As long as the bullies and the abusers of the Kotaku culture go unchallenged, it will continue to permit video games and the industry from getting the respect it deserves. No one can really move forward when the conversation is controlled by a selfish group interested only in their own success. The Kotaku culture is a group of similarly minded gatekeepers that rely on fear and silence to get what they want, and because of those close associations, they can sabotage someone's prospects if they fight back. They present themselves as sensitive or righteous to other people's suffering, but are really only looking to gain clout and power. Something as simple as accountability for abuse victims manipulated by unethical reporting should be a no-brainer. But asking for that accountability means asking everyone to play by the same rules, and that isn't how it works. If one member of the Kotaku culture is made to be held accountable, what's to say it won't happen to more of them? This is why Natalie Lawhead has been ignored as long as she has, while Cecilia D'Anastasio can enjoy a new job and the defense of Steven Totillo. Can the game's media be expected to fairly represent audiences, industry professionals, and gaming when it can't even treat these survivors as real people? Can we trust the game's media to be honest about anything if it will manipulate rape survivors? The solution to the cultural problem is the tireless but simple act of refusing to be silent. Tell everyone who has even a little interest in what happened. Even if it's just when they mention Kotaku, or a website that seems to be part of the Kotaku culture. When you see someone in the gaming press, or even someone in the general industry, writing something sensational or unfair, ask yourself, is this person a part of the Kotaku culture? Remember their name and observe their behavior. If they display a history of this, or interact regularly and strongly with someone from the Kotaku culture, there's a chance they might be. Kotaku, similar journalists and bloggers, must be held accountable for their culture's abuse of power. When they are seen as the bullies and harassers they accuse others of being, their unscrupulous friends in the industry that give them any power or legitimacy will want nothing to do with them. If you want to tell others but have trouble finding your own words, please share this video. I've made it in the hopes that the information will be more accessible and give attention to voices that need to be heard, like lawheads. If you prefer not to share this video for whatever reason, please share Lawhead's blog, Graf and Reads Medium post, or any of the other links provided. I've made this case about the gaming press being destructed for more than six years, and people are still being harmed. As long as Kotaku and their culture exists, the bullies and abusers will thrive in the industry, hurting whoever they like and rewriting the rules for themselves. This is a stain on all games media, and it can't go ignored anymore. What does it say about us if we cannot find it within ourselves to care about those who are hurt and vulnerable? Do we want this industry to be a place that chooses not to care because it's too inconvenient? What might be a few seconds to share this video, or a few minutes explaining what Kotaku is and has done, will help someone who's already been hurt by them, and hopefully save whoever they might use next. Take care and until next time.